Okay, so let's get moving. So this is the first case, and I believe I might have showed this to you the last time. I'll just kind of quickly go through it in about two seconds, but it's another metastasis. This is very tricky. You uh, can't have any, any, uh, there we go. So this is, again, we talked about metastatic neoplasms, and this is just dermal-based, poorly differentiated, squamous material here in neoplasm. And this, this was a metastatic lung cancer. So just remember, neoplastic cells in the dermis, no contiguity to the epidermis. Think metastasis. Probably the only one you're really going to need to know for the boards is probably going to be breast cancer, maybe colon cancer, melanoma, not breast. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not, not lung. So, so don't worry too terribly much about that. All right, this one uh, is a shave biopsy. And um, does anybody want to want to give this one a go? Uh, I mean, we don't like shave biopsies of things, but unfortunately, it's a real world, and that's what we get. So we'll show it to you. And if you have to do it as unknowns as resonance, maybe you'll have such an antipathy to doing it <laughs> when you get in practice. You won't you won't ever shave an inflammatory disease. So I can go. Um... This is a really thin shave, um, not a lot of dermis, so it's hard to tell exactly where it's at, but I would guess maybe like a extremity or a trunk. Um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's almost impossible. We, we can probably rule out a few things. It doesn't look like it's near volar skin because it doesn't have a mark thick and cornified layer, but um, it doesn't have a lot of follicles and things like that. So it's probably not the face, not a spacious gland. So yeah, probably trunk or extremity, but it's hard to tell when you get a superficial shape of something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just from top, or I guess it looks more neoplastic than inflammatory to me. I think it's benign. Um, okay. What kind of differentiation? What do you think we were looking at here? What kind of cells are these? Um, histiocytes. <clears throat> okay, good. Now, histiocytes. Right. So there are some lymphocytes in there. Um, okay. But histiocytes, is that usually inflammatory or usually neoplastic? Um, it's usually inflammatory. Yeah, yeah. Usually it's inflammatory. And when histiocytes predominate, what do we generally what type of inflammatory condition do we generally think about in that situation? Um, like a granulomatous? Yeah, yeah, good. So that, you know, again, and this may not be a traditional granulomatous condition that we, you know, tend to think about. We'll talk about that. But, um, but generally, when you think of histiocytes predominating, you say, hey, you know, maybe it's granulomatous. And then you kind of look at and apply more criteria and see if it seems to fit or not. Mm -hmm. So... You want to stick with neoplastic or are you going to switch over now to inflammatory since you think they're mostly histiocytes? Um, I guess we can do inflammatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, well, well, go ahead and tell me what you were thinking. Okay. Um, well, I wasn't, well, just looking at it, the histiocytes look a little bit foamier than usual. Um, I didn't see any multinucleated giant cells. They don't look atypical to me. Um, so I was actually leaning more towards like uh, xanthoma, um, xanthoma. Okay. Is uh, a xanthoma an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? It's actually a neoplastic, benign neoplastic. Or am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I, I, I generally, you know, xanthomas are, are collections of lipids, so they're really metabolic disorders where you get lipid that gets deposited in the skin. Now, there is a an atypical fibroxanthoma, which is um, a neoplasm, and if you want to talk about xanthogranuloma, I still would think about that as being an inflammatory process. Personally, I, I just, to me, okay. a lot of histiocytes in there, I think of it as being inflammatory in the vast majority of the cases, even like a dermatofibroma, xanthomatous mm -hmm. PF is really an inflammatory process. It's a reactive inflammatory entity with histiocytes and fibroblasts and 
you know, in other inflammatory cells. So it's more of a, a semantic thing, but I, I tend to favor that being an inflammatory process, but you're right. Now let's talk about histiocytes for a second. You kind of open that door a little bit. Um, so tell me all of, maybe not all, but tell me a bunch of different morphologies of histiocytes that you can see that help you to make a diagnosis. So you used something here. So what are some morphologic features of histiocytes? What are some of the types of histiocytes that you can see under the microscope? Um, are you referring to like, in this case, lipophages, um, like, or foamy histiocytes? Yeah, so these histiocytes have got abundant uh, pale cytoplasm and um, it's kind of slightly grayish, if you can see there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can say, okay, that's foamy. So what causes a foamy, quote unquote, histiocyte? What's the, you, you said one thing that can cause it, lipid. Lipid deposition. Yeah. Anything else that can cause it? I don't think infection usually causes this much foaminess. Well, there's one infection that can. Like leprosy? Yeah, yeah. Hansen's disease, tubercular, uh, a, a lepromatous Hansen's disease. In mm -hmm. fact, it's still lipid, but the lipid is from the waxy acid fast, you know, capsule cell wall, if you will, of the, of the bacterium. It's not actually endogenous lipid uh, that's basically depositing the skin. So yeah, that's, that's something else. Sometimes you can actually see uh, mucophages with when mucin gets ingested by uh, histiocytes, like for example, in a uh, uh, mucosil, uh, you sometimes see these cells that look pretty much like this. So the differential diagnosis is between whether there's mucin in the cytoplasm or whether it's lipid. So that's that can be uh, sometimes a little tough to tell, but usually not. What other kind of histiocytes? You get foamy histiocytes. What are some other histiocytes? Multinucleated. Multinucleated histiocytes, yeah. And there's several different types of those too, right? What are a couple of multinucleated histiocytes? You have like the Teuton. Um, yeah, Teuton giant cells, Teuton multinucleated histiocytes. And uh, I won't ask you to kind of describe those for us. I'm sure you know what that looks like. But what are some others, a couple others that are multinucleated histiocytes? They're like the Lingren. There are Lang Langhans, Langhans, giant cell. That's one. And uh, there's there's one other. Langhans kind of looks like a horseshoe, a wreath of nuclei, but not a complete wreath like you see with the two-ton giant cell with a pale cytoplasm also. Uh, and then you see the uh, you kind of a horseshoe of nuclei, kind of a, a Langhans cell. I'm not sure that's really that much different. Uh, I think a lot of times in the old days, guys just described things and drew pictures of them and gave them different names, but they're probably part of the same entity, really. And then uh, like a foreign body giant cell, that's mm -hmm. one where you just get nuclei kind of scattered throughout the histiocyte, and those usually don't have foamy cytoplasm to them. So uh, those are some other kinds of histiocytes that can be useful when you're making a diagnosis. And then there's epithelioid histiocytes, like you see with a you know, sarcoidal granuloma, where the cell, the histiocytes almost take on the cytologic appearance of an epithelial cell. So that's, you know, basically another thing that can help you with the diagnosis. So you, you think, what do you, of all those possible various things we just talked about, you think this is a xanthoma? Yeah, and I was thinking maybe more of an eruptive xanthoma, because there are some lymphocytes in there. And reading that you can see lymphocytes in eruptive xanthomas. It's possible. Yeah, I don't remember the, the story on this case. Uh, it, it was called, and yeah, we did think this was an eruptive xanthoma. This is really a lousy biopsy because a patient's got eruptive xanthoma is going to have 100 lesions or more, and they're going to be these yellow papules just widely distributed, and it'd be very easy to take a punch biopsy of that. Um, and but they decided to take a shave for some crazy reason. So could this possibly be the surface of a tuberous or a tendinous anthoma? 
possibly. <laughs> yeah, it could. <laughs> yeah, that's why it'd be nice to get a punch because you like to see the architecture. These lesions are usually relatively small. Um, they usually kind of only get down into about the mid reticular dermis. So they can be more diffuse, but they're usually relatively small. And when they come up quickly, and eruptive xanthomas can come up literally in a matter of minutes, uh, interestingly enough. And if you ever have seen a patient with eruptive xanthoma, they got like a cholesterol that's 10,000 or something like that, or a triglyceride that's 10,000. And then you, you give them like insulin if it's diabetic, that's in ketoacidosis, and then in their blood sugar goes down, the eruptive xanthomas can disappear literally before your eyes. They can go away really, really quickly, which is, is astonishing when you see all this inflammation here, you'd say, well, gosh, that ought to take a week or two to go away, but they actually can, can really vanish almost when you get their, um, their triglycerides down. That's how fast the immune system can deal with this sort of thing. One other thing about an eruptive xanthoma, because the triglycerides are so high and they do come up in an eruptive fashion, there's often extracellular lipid and it can look a lot like mucin. It's grayish blue, just like mucin can be grayish blue. And then you get the histiocytes that have filled up the lipids so quickly they, they, they rupture just like little bubbles of balloons. And it can look like granuloma annulare. And so that's one thing in the differential diagnosis, which would have been nice if it had a punch biopsy. We could have seen that, but we don't really see that here. So uh, basically, this is an example of, uh, of a, an eruptive xanthoma taken by shave biopsy technique. So I hope everybody at least thought of that or, or got that right, or at least got it into the category of the xanthomatous disorders. Okay, anybody want to give this one a go? I can do this one. Um, so it looks like a punch biopsy, uh, pretty top heavy inflammatory process. Um, so there is some extension into the uh, mid reticular dermis. Um, seems to be pretty centered. Um, and then the epidermis uh, almost looks, well, actually, epidermis is pretty much gone for the most part. So it just looks to be eroded or ulcerated away. Yeah, over here it is for sure. I think it's still present over here. Yeah. But this, you're right. There it's gone. Totally, totally gone away. Absolutely. What's the pattern of the inflammation? Um, from like scan, I thought, you know, perivascular. Yeah, it's perivascular, and it's also a little bit between the blood vessels, too. Mm -hmm. It is tracking mostly around the blood vessels. You're correct. What kind of cells are these? So they didn't look um, blue enough just to be purely a lymphocytic process. Um, didn't have do, they, do they look sort of black? This is a good example of, of this how this differs from classic lymphocytes. I think we may have a lymphocytic infiltrate coming up. Yeah, we, have, we, we don't, but we have some others that will have some lymphocytes in there. But normally at low power, when you see lymphocytes, they really look black, like mm -hmm. dark. Can you tell that this sort of looks almost sort of purplish in a way? It's not quite as dark as that? Definitely, yeah. So you can, it says, you know, these, these don't look like classic lymphocytes at low power. Now we're going to go higher magnification. You're going to see really pretty quickly with there, but you can see a low power. It's like, wow, this, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be the first thing you would think about be one of the lipstick infiltrates here. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. And what else do you see here? Um, a lot of extravasated red blood cells. Yeah. Uh, good. So let's go to higher magnification. And now what do we see? Just a ton of newts. Ton of newts. So see, you can see at low power that when you see it look like this, it kind of look a little bit sort of, well, it's been described as salt and pepper. I'm not sure I like that term so much, but it, it looks, it's definitely not jet black like lymphocytes. They're not pale like histiocytes. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, well, what else can that possibly be? You say, well, they, they could be neutrophils. And as we go to higher magnification, you can see that, that there are just tons of neutrophils here. That's not forming a sort of a, a dense sheet of neutrophils like we see with sweets or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's definitely got neutrophils. And, and you said that it was around blood vessels. Well, what do we got going on here? Um, I mean, it looks like the vessel wall is just pretty much destroyed. Um, lots of leukocytoclasia and yes. then, uh, fibrinous debris as well. Absolutely. Yes. Good. And then uh, what about the epidermis? You said it was gone over there. What about here? Um, I'm 
Yeah, it looks like it's necros it's necrosis. Yes. Good. This is necrosis. This epidermis is dying. Um, these cells are vacuolated. They've got a, a pycnotic nuclei here in many of these areas here. The, the cytoplasm is swollen and, and, and sort of pale. So yeah, this is, is dying, which makes sense when you've got this kind of thing going on beneath it, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the diagnosis? Uh, vasculitis. And then if we had to like classify it, probably a small vessel um, with all the newts, postular vasculitis. Yeah, good. Excellent. That's exactly what it is. Now, if you talk to guys like Warren Pied, who spend their life studying medical dermatology and vasculitis and vasculopathy, he says, and he's probably right, is that there are no large blood vessels in the skin, period, the end. It's just, they're all small <laughs> and to him until you get into like the renal arteries and, you know, large arteries internally. Those are considered medium size and, and larger blood vessels and arteries. He says in the skin, they're really all sort of small to medium size and really not large. So here we're probably dealing with arterioles and, and, uh, and capillaries, but uh, and venules, but you can see that it actually if you get this many blood vessels involved, you can get an infarct and you can actually get necrosis of the epidermis and it can slough off and it can form a blister. Um, it can form pustules. And so, yeah, this would be pustular leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Now, so that's, that's good. You got the diagnosis, right? So let's, let's ask a couple of uh, more detailed questions. If you had to, to bet mm -hmm. which disease this is being, that's going to cause this pattern. What's the most common to cause pustular vasculitis in dermatology? Most common. Um, oh, like HSP? Yeah. Yeah. IgA mediated. And that makes sense because IgA is a direct neutrophil chemotactin. Yeah. So when you deposit a lot of IgA in your skin, um, it gives more neutrophils. So if it's just a garden variety, immune complex mediated vasculitis, say from lupus or something like that, it usually doesn't give you this degree of pustular involvement. So, it, you know, now you're not going to be definitive and say, ah, it looks like this. It has to be HSP. But uh, statistically speaking, it's more likely to be HSP when it's got this pattern to it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do immunofluorescence, if you were to do it today on this specimen, it might be negative because you've just basically wiped out all of the blood vessels, basically with all this inflammation. And, and there may not be any residual IgA left that you can detect with direct immunofluorescence. If you did it, usually you know, within the first 24 to 36 hours um, of, a, of a lesion, kind of a relatively acute lesion, you don't want to get it too super early, but uh, if you get it within say a day or two of when the petechiae kind of develop, that's probably the best time to biopsy it for direct immuno. And if it's positive, it's helpful. If it's negative, you know, it doesn't rule it out. So that's, that's uh, one thing uh, about that. Now, the other item of the differential diagnosis can give you a, a neutrophil rich um, vasculitis. What's the other, one other entity that, that uh, or family of entities that can give you a neutrophil rich vas <coughs> vasculitis without a lot of leukocytoclasia. Um, oh, is it the one in a child, like hemorrhagic edema? Well, that's that's probably just a variant of okay. IgA vasculitis, Finkelstein's disease, uh, yeah. the acute hemorrhagic edema of infancy. Uh, and those kids get these these uh, urticarial nodular lesions often on their face and whatnot. I mean, it, it, it looks more like a lymphocytic infiltrate clinically, and you biopsy it and it shows this, interestingly enough. So um, that's just a variant of IgA, HSP, and, and kiddos. But there's one other entity where you can get vasculitis mm -hmm. with a lot of thrombosis of the blood vessels with intact neutrophils and limited amount of leukocytoclasia. But it can still give you ischemia with overlying necrosis of the epidermis. Maybe like the cryos variant, like type 2 and 3? Cryoglomulonemic vasculitis. You know, those usually there is. You're you're right that you can get thrombotic vasculopathy with vasculitis in, in some of those cryoglobulinemias and some of those mugus kind of lesions. But those usually give you leukocytoclasia. It's really a variant of leukocytoclastic vasculitis with a little bit more vasculopathy. But this would be a situation where you get intact neutrophils with thrombosis 
with neutrophils and, and less fibrin. It's, it's almost kind of like a, something has gone in there and it's kind of plugged up the blood vessels. And then it's got neutrophils that are not reacting in an immune complex situation there. Um, like articarial? No, that's also immune complex. I see. I don't know. Anybody want to help them out? Nobody knows? Septic vasculitis. Oh, Septic wow. vasculitis. People that have, have uh, meningococcemia, yeah. uh, gonococcemia, that gives you vascular thrombosis, but it's really due to bacteria that are circulating that, that are inside the blood vessels that then cause immune inflammation and they clot the blood vessel and then you get intact neutrophils that come in. It's not really immune complex mediated. And obviously they can get overlying epidermal necrosis, they can get infarctions, they can get uh, ischemia. So you should always think about that. So when you see lots of neutrophils with leukocyteoclasia and fibrin, that's LCV. And if it's got lots of polys like this, it's you know likely to be IgA mediated. If you see thrombosed blood vessels with intact neutrophils and less fibrin, it's just kind of the vessels thrombosed. There's really no fibrin because it's not really immune complex mediated with intact polys, think of septic vasculitis. And again, gonococcus, meningococcus, those are Ig, they, they are in, they're chemotactic for neutrophils also. Mm -hmm. So it produces, it's the same sort of pathophysiologic mechanism a little bit, but it's not an immune complex mediated situation. Mm -hmm. So that's the classic differential diagnosis of, of uh, LCV is, is septic vasculitis. So you always want to kind of keep that in mind too. But that's good. I mean, that's, that's, that's very, very, uh, typical for the type of thing that you might get on a board examination right there. Hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, who wants to give this one a go? Hello, I can go. Um, so we see here um, some proliferation. Oh, well, first of all, this is a, a shave. Uh, Good. It's a small popular lesion. Uh, Good. Good. That looks small, symmetrical, and well circumscribed. Uh, so Excellent. favoring benign. Yeah. Good. Is it so, an epithelial or a non-epithelial lesion? Epithelial. Good. And what type of epithelium are we looking at? Follicular, immature follicular uh, epithelium. Excellent. Superb. Okay, good. So you've, you've narrowed it down very quickly into a small category of entities. So now we're dealing with benign follicular and nexal neoplasms. So there's probably only about 10 of those that you need to know. Okay, so um, I see some cystic structures like horn cysts and some radiating uh, radiating from those cysts. From those cysts are some uh, immature hair follicles. Good. Um, but I don't see any like big cysts, like a mother cyst to think of trichofolliculoma. Um, okay, I why do you think that might be? I'm sorry. Why is that? Why do you think you may not be seeing that here? Um, is it too superficial? Well, it may be that we just need to cut deeper sections or something. Yeah. You know, it may be if we cut into a little deeper, we'd see the central cystic area. So the good lesson there is that if it's got everything else that looks like a trichofolliculoma, which is the, the answer that you were getting ready, you just said, um, don't have one thing that isn't there throw you off and, and just basically... Uh, lead you down a wrong pathway. So let's say there's a multiple choice question here and they have trichofolliculoma as one choice. And they might, they probably would show a more classic one, which does have the central, you know, cystic area with the nice little radiating buds. But uh, what if they put on here trichoepithelioma? Does this look like a trichoepithelioma or closer to a trichofolliculoma? Uh, closer to a trichofolliculoma. Yeah, yeah, it really does. I mean, it, it, it doesn't really have the classic features of a trichoepithelioma at all? Or what if they put on there something like, say, um, tumor of the follicular infundibulum? Does this look anything like that? Um, not really. Um, I don't see the, the, well, like 
buds or bulb uh, bulbar structures that you see in the follicular cyst? Yeah, well, T TFI is basically a horizontally oriented uh, lesion with these small little miniaturized mantle-like recapitulations at the dermal epidermal junction, sort of not even really as, as and they actually kind of look more squamous because it's called follicular infundibulum, which has more of a squamous epithelium like this, as opposed to the matrical epithelium like this. So that wouldn't be a good choice. You're right. This is a small papule that's got a central, that's probably the pore of it. And, and I, if we cut deeper, we might even see the, the little central cyst. So the main thing here is it, it, this isn't a perfect classic textbook um, trichofliculoma, but it's got about, you know, 75% of the features of a trichofliculoma. It's got the trichofliculoma, uh, rather. It's got the little radiating inferior portions of the follicles right here. Um, it's got the areas here that look like the inferior portion of the follicle. So that's the main thing about a trichofolliculoma is that it's, it's the inferior portion of the follicle that's being recapitulated. And this is coming from the mantle zone of the follicle. I mean, we, we say it's coming from there, but it's basically, if you look at the mantle zone, it's a stem cell area. And that can differentiate in, in like this, in inferior little miniaturized parts of a follicle. It can, can sometimes give you more of an infundibular uh, appearance. And we probably think that TFI is probably from the mantle zone. So it can give you several different morphologies, but if it's recapitulating this inferior portion and it's kind of got what looks like it's radiating, it's a variant of a trichofolliculoma. So that's, that's, you're right, that's exactly what it is. The main thing here is just adult uh, let yourself be thrown down a wrong uh, pathway just because it doesn't have every single perfect feature of it. it it's, it's better for that than a trichoep, for example, where you'd see more stroma and small little cysts. And uh, even though you get papillary mesenchymal bodies, you don't get these kind of structures that are relatively large inferior portions of follicles. And in fact, you know, the, the large cyst might have been down in here, for example. We just don't know because they took a shaved biopsy of it. Okay, got it. We're well, good. Anybody have any questions about this? It's pretty straightforward. So again, the just very the way she did this is exactly right. Just go through it. Don't just hip shoot. You know, say okay, shave biopsy, epithelial, follicular. It's it's differentiating more towards the inferior part of the follicle as opposed to the upper part of the follicle or the isthmus of the follicle, and it's got these little small structures that are radiating. And so the best diagnosis is going to be trichofolliculoma. It's not, it's not perfect, but these things don't read the textbooks. None of the adnexal tumors read the textbooks. Okay, so it's very common to see uh, funny morphologies when you get real world biopsies of these instead of just a, a classic textbook photograph that's, that's generated for writing a text. Okay. All right, who wants to do this one? I can try this one again. Okay. Uh, so we have a punch biopsy here. Looks like predominantly uh, lymphocytic infiltrate in the superficial dermis there with some uh, pallor, maybe some edema. Now, can you, can you tell everybody at this power the difference between this and what that pustular vasculitis looked like a minute ago? See how these are dark? They're black at low power, and those were kind of purplish. They were kind of amorphous in color. They weren't like this. So at this power, you know, obviously we're going to go to higher power, but you can say these are probably, these are lymphocytes most likely. And so the other ones say, you know, these are most likely not lymphocytes. So you can at least put yourself into a category early as opposed to, you know, you wouldn't proceed down the pathway of a lymphocytic infiltrate in that other case. Here, you might. So we're going to see as we go to higher magnification. So yeah, you notice there's, there's some pallor. That's good. You pick that up at low power as well. Okay. Anything else? Um, and then in the deeper aspect of the punch, um, lots of red blood cell extravagant. Well, I think I mean, they might've just caught an artery possibly. Yeah, that, that's, this is artifact. Whenever you see this and there's like a big clump of red cells just kind of at the periphery, 
you know, you've all done punch biopsies now, you know, you know, how they, they'll bleed pretty profusely depending on which part of the body you're on. That's just dragged in into the specimen. That's, that's not really hemorrhage. So they, mm -hmm. you know, probably got pretty aggressive with their uh, lidocaine injection and person may have a little bit of bleeding tendency. So that, that's not really truly part of the process. This is where the action is up here. So don't, don't get distracted if, if you see something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, even from scan, it looks like the epidermis is primarily intact. It doesn't look good too involved. Um, probably trunk and extremities, not acral, not uh, facial skin. There's not a lot of like follicles around here. Good. Um, so I had, at this point, I had to scan in or zoom in to get more. But if you if you wanted to make a differential here, what would be some things that you might think about? Um, yeah, this, like by I, the way, is a is a very difficult diagnosis here, and I'm not as concerned if you get this answer correct because this is not the type of they're not going to show you this this example of this entity on the board. But there are some things you could kind of come up with as a potential differential diagnosis just based on this field right here, for example. Yeah, I think the combination of the papillary dermal edema and the um, lymphocytic infiltrate in a super, super primarily superficial perivascular pattern made me think of PMLE. Um, I thought that some of them were pretty, some of the lymphocytes were pretty tightly adherent to the vessels, almost like that coat sleeving pattern that can be seen in gyrate erythemas. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the main thing that I wanted you to say at this power. Um, now, if we go to higher magnification, you may see a couple of other confounding things that sort of don't fit that. Usually, PMLE is superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate with papillary dermal edema, but photodermatitis, um, again, that's also doesn't read the textbooks. I've seen plenty of photodermatitis where there's there's superficial when it should be superficial and deep. Um, so that just you know again. But this could theoretically be a photodermatitis, could possibly be PMLE just based on that pattern. So that's when you when you see lymphocytic infiltrate plus papillary edema, think that. May not always be that, but that's exactly what, what you should think. Now, let's go to higher magnification. And there's some other things here that look a little funny for that. Yeah, I thought there was um, more interface than I would have yes. for those diagnoses. Yes, yes, and good. So that would tend to militate against PMLE because that generally does not involve the interface like mm -hmm. this. And then um, a faint bit of spongiosis um, that's coming through as well. Um, but is there very much spongiosis here? Not relative to the inflammatory infiltrate. Yeah, it's minimal. It's minimal. It's really more interface here with papillary dermal edema, and then you've got the lymphocytic infiltrate, which the papillary dermal edema here is kind of a confounding variable, but it's something you do see in this entity sometimes. If we didn't have the papillary dermal edema, you'd probably be thinking, you'd probably get the diagnosis correct. But the papillary dermal edema is kind of unusual, and that's why this will not, this example won't be on the board examination. But what are some things that you can think about that give you a superficial lymphocytic infiltrate with lymphocytes involving the interface like here with epidermal necrosis with individual necrotic keratinocytes like you see here. Um, so yeah, if there was epidermal necrosis, um, please. And it's not confluent epidermal necrosis like that case of the pustular vasculitis. Yeah. Uh, right. Now this, this, if we let this thing go on for a few more days, it might, you know, this is probably within the first 24 to 48 hours of this disease hmm. is really acute. And that's why you've got this papillary dermal edema, which is really a little bit unusual for this entity somewhat, but you do have all these individually necrotic keratinocytes, which could lead to confluent epidermal necrosis within the next couple of days or so. Yeah. So putting these together, the interface with a lichenoid infiltrate and then some um, what looks like vascular change um, and necrosis, maybe like early EM. Um, yeah, now, now I want to just correct you a little bit when you said lichenoid. Okay, so be careful about that because lichenoid, remember, is a dense band-like 
infiltrate of, of lymphocytes or whatever the cell type is that totally obscures the dermatomal junction. Usually lichenoid and papillodermal edema sort of almost, um, you know, mutually exclusive. You, you generally don't get those in the same situation because if you've got papillodermal edema, it's expanding the papillodermis. You can't really have a lichenoid infiltrate that's obscuring the D junction there very frequently. Sometimes LS and A maybe, but but that's really rare. So, so this is more interface vacuolar with individually necrotic keratinocytes. And this is erythemultiforme. So you're right. The answer is correct. Um, one other thing I will point out is that notice there's a basket weave cornified layer. Yeah. So EM is a, is a good example. Whenever you see interface dermatitis with individually necrotic keratinocytes and you've got a basket weave cornified layer, think multiforme, early fixed drug eruption, um, early evolving Stevens-Johnson or TN even. Um, the papillodermal edema here is, is, is a little bit unusual. You can see it in EM sometimes. Um, you can even see spongiosis early in EM sometimes. So again, an early lesion of EM, they can sometimes look a little bit different than the classic textbook form that you see. Now, now on the board, they're probably going to show you the textbook form. Okay, they're not going to show you this. They're not going to show you one that's got this confounding variable that might make you think of polymorphous light eruption. And, you know, this could also theoretically be um, a phototoxic drug eruption, too. I wouldn't say that it couldn't be that. Usually, um, you don't get the necrotic keratinocytes at the base of the epidermis in a phototoxic drug reaction. It usually involves, you know, most of the epidermis. Um, and it's a little bit unusual to get papillodermal in that. But you know, that's another thing in the differential diagnosis here. Um, there are no eosinophils in the infiltrate, so that militates against both fixed drug eruption mm -hmm. and drug eruption, but you don't have to get eosinophils in a drug eruption, uh, but you usually don't get eosinophils in erythemal deforming. It's not that you can't, but you usually don't. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so good. This has a lot of good teaching points. It's got the lymphocytic infiltrate that you noted, the low power. I, I would want you to think about PMLE. So it's sometimes your differential at this power is differential is different than when you go to this power. So that's, that's valuable. So you want to formulate a, a general differential at low power and then go to high power and confirm it and throw out if it doesn't make sense. So, oh, it's probably not PMLE because it's got all these necrotic keratinocytes. So it's got the papillodermal edema, which is, is seen in PMLE, but we now know you can also see it in erythemultiforming in an early stage. Hmm. So good. Any questions about that? All right. It's got some pretty good inflammatory skin disorders here. Anybody want to give this one a go? Yeah. So we have a pench biopsy, um, looks inflammatory from this power. Okay. And you even here kind of see this layered cake appearance, top to bottom and kind of side to side with these pinker areas and the more basophilic, more inflammatory areas. What kind of cells are we looking at here? I think the more basophilic bluer areas are probably histiocytes. Yeah, what, what kind of cells are these? Those look more that black color, yeah. maybe lymph. It's probably lymphocytes. And, and, if, and, and then these, see how pale these are? Histiocytes. Mm -hmm. So we can tell a lot at low power. It's, it's valuable to do that. And you described a pattern that is obviously associated with a disorder. Mm -hmm. NLD. Yeah. Now you have to be careful <laughs> about or using the... Um, cliche and instantly getting a diagnosis because people that write textbooks and they will write board examination questions know that and so they're going to say okay good we're going to show them a layer cake and then we're going to uh, we're going to have it be something that simulates the classic layer cake because we know that they have a, a reflex that's kind of functioning around the level of the midbrain that when they think of a layer cake they instantly reflex to NLD so we're going to throw something on there it looks like NLD but it's not so sometimes just getting the diagnosis is, is just the first part of the fun. So let's go to our magnification and see if we really think it is an LD. So now we've got some multinucleated histiocytes. What else have we got in here that helps you with the diagnosis of an LD at this power? So you can't see the layer cake anymore. I took that away from you. So what can you see here? 
some altered collagen. Yeah. What kind of, we'll take altered, what do we need? We'll say altered. I guess the term is the necro, necrobiosis. Yeah, I hate that of, term. I don't, I'm like you. I can't stand that term because it means basically it's death, life, and whatever. You know, collagen is dead, right? It's, it's not even a living tissue. It, it's basically this, it's a fiber. It's, it's like saying a string is alive. Well, you can't, you know, a string is cellulose. You know, you, it's no longer alive. It's never alive. It's basically produced. It's, it's like keratin. So you can't really have necrobiosis. I, I just, I hate the term. Basically, we have degenerated collagen that's kind of got this pink smudgy appearance to it, surrounded by these, these histiocytes here. So it's a palisaded granulomatous dermatitis with degenerated collagen in the center of the palisade versus mucin, which we see in what disorder? And palisaded granulomatous dermatitis with mucin in the center of the palisade. You guys should know that, especially in third years now. That should be a reflex for you, just like layer keg. GA. Yeah, GA. And what if we saw fibrin in here and it's situated way down here in the subcutis, for example? What would that be? Fibrin in the center of the palisade. Is that the rheumatoid nodule? Yes. Yes. Good. So degenerated collagen in the center of the palisade in an LD, mucin and GA, and then fibrin and rheumatoid nodules. Those, those are the basic three palisaded granulomatous dermatitides. So this is an LD, um, pretty straightforward. We talked about these being lymphocytes. What other kind of cells like to live whenever there's sclerotic collagen? Wherever you get sclerotic collagen in the skin, what cell follows that? Every time almost. You're looking at them. Lymphocytes? Or? Yes, but not really. Plasma cells. Yeah, plasma cells. Always think plasma cells whenever you see sclerotic collagen, okay? And it doesn't mean syphilis in that case. So you very, very commonly see these lymphoplasmacytic aggregates in necrobiasis lipoidica, you also see them in lupus erythematosus profundus because you get the, the sclerotic fat, sclerotic collagen replaces the fat in that situation. So very common to see that. Okay, so you're writing a board examination for your colleagues and you're in, a, in, in the, the board of dermatology. Okay, we, we want you to write a question that's going to, to trick them. They're gonna see at low power that it looks like a layer cake and we want it to not be necrobiosis lipoidic. So what else are you gonna put in the differential here that could possibly confuse your colleagues here? Not an easy question. You have to know the pattern and you have to know other things that can give you this kind of interstitial pattern like this. This, this is not really classic rings in the skin, right? Like GA. This is more kind of an interstitial palisaded granulomatous pattern. So what looks like this? What else can give you an interstitial mostly pattern with epithelioid cells? An like interstitial this. GA? Yeah, that's one. Definitely, if you wanted to trick up your colleagues, you'd throw that in there. And then given that this has got degenerated collagen, you probably wouldn't favor that. This is really more diffuse than interstitial GA, but yeah, that's one thing you would put in there. I would. What else might you throw in there? If you can do this, you can do dermatopathology. <laughs> if you can come up with differential diagnoses for things like this, and this is what you kind of need to be able to do in your brain, when you're looking at something at low power, say, well, yeah, you know, it looks like an LD, but what else could it be? You always have to ask yourself, what else could it be? Not just make a quick Schnell diagnosis. You know, you need to sort of say, what else could possibly do this? So interstitial GA is one. Anybody else know what else can give you an interstitial mostly pattern that's got some epithelioid morphology at low power, but they're not really epithelioid histiocytes? In the chat, there's metastatic breast cancer. Let me see. I'll go to the chat. Yeah, metastatic breast, good. Um, what else? 
interstitial MF. Um, yeah, possibly so. Uh, that's pretty rare bird, but I, I would allow you to throw that in there. But there's one other thing I'm sort of reading my mind, but, but it should be in your mind also. The plaque stage of Capuchy sarcoma could look just like this, very, very much like this. So those would be some of the things that you should be thinking about. And then we other interstitial mostly disorders that we, we've talked about before too, like morphia, like, like inflammatory morphia. And that wouldn't give you this many histiocytes, low magnification, you'd see mostly lymphs and again, some plasma cells there and some eosinophils if you're at higher magnification. But basically um, that can also give you an interstitial mostly pattern. So just bone up on that interstitial mostly pattern. Some people call that a busy dermis pattern. Um, you know, even angiosarcoma theoretically might look something like this. So just remember that there are other things in there than in NLD. Um, and so don't just think that's the only thing that can give you, uh, give you that, that dis diagnosis. Now this one's pretty simple here. Yeah, I can describe this one. So it looks like we have a shave of a papule or a nodule um, and what part of the body? Well, hard to be sure, but there's one clue. Oh, maybe the face or head. Yeah, yeah. and notice how thin the yeah. appearance is here. And this is all reactive stuff here. That's part of the kid was scratching it or whatever, and it probably <laughs> is a kid. Just interestingly enough, but um, what gives you super thin epidermis? And if we even saw maybe around the eye, yeah, area, good. We're talking eyelid. Epidermis. eyelid, good. So the reason I'm giving you that clue is it may have something to do with the actual diagnosis in this case. But what's going on here? What are we looking so at? So I think that it's the depositional category. We have this really deeply basophilic material. Yes. And what gives um, you this jet calcium. black, dark, deep purple color like this? <laughs> calcium does. Yeah, so cal some sort of calcification. Yeah, and these are little small, little calcified, little almost semi body like structures. These, little, these mm. are little, um, this is calcium that's actually formed crystals, if you will, in the skin. This is the, the color that calcium stains with hematoxylin and eosin. It really is so um, basophilic. I mean, it just loves uh, the hematoxylin. So it just really, really gets super uh, purple when you see mm -hmm. that. So calcium, you're right. So what's the di What's the short diagnosis? Um, well, we thought it was the subepidermal calcified nodule, okay. just because it's it's really in the upper dermis. It looks pretty well circumscribed. It's a little papule yeah. on the face. Good. Good. <laughs> um, that's what, that's exactly right. That's exactly what the diagnosis is. So, and that's the location too. Usually the eyelid. It's usually in a child. Um, there's no sun damage here or whatnot. So we don't know it's a kid, but it, it usually is. And it looks like this. You're right. But what's this general, quote, category, if you will, of what we're looking at here? Um, just cutaneous yeah. calcification. Calcinosis cutis, cutaneous calcification. And that's one diagnosis is subabnormal calcified nodule. Um, what are a few other settings where you can see calcinosis cutis, like not necessarily like this, but where else can you see calcinosis? Similarly. Um, okay, so you can get the just dystrophic calcification in yeah. dermatomyositis or other disorders. Exactly. So you can get it as a secondary phenomenon in a metabolic or systemic illness. That's correct. Right. Like Calcifylaxis, for example. I mean, that's a bad situation. <laughs> quite bad. And then um, you can have I guess, I don't know if it's a variant of this, but the scrotal calcinosis yeah, also. Yeah, it's not, it's probably slightly different, but yeah, same thing. You get these big, large lakes of calcium that look kind of like little cysts and you see them in the scrotal area. They look like these white areas. It's it's probably in the same family. I agree with you. Um, and then you can also get, when you have system, if you have high calcium or phosphorus, you can just get calcium deposition, I think. Yeah, that's more like cal like calciphylaxis, for yeah. example. You get vascular calcification and can be fatal. It's not a good situation. 
And then there's lots of other situations, you know, calcification and neoplasms, you know, for example, mm -hmm. breast cancer, even when you do mammographies or looking for you know, microscopic calcifications here that goes along with cancer. Um, you can calcification and polymetricoma. So there's a lot of different situations where you get calcification. So I would recommend that you be able to, number one, recognize that this is calcium. And number two, uh, know the differential diagnostic patterns where you can see calcification. And if you see like lakes of calcium, large chunks of calcium like this, that's more likely to be things like um, subepidermal calcified nodule or scrotal calcinosis or something like that, as opposed to uh, say like calciflax it usually gives you small little microscopic calcifications or you know PXE where you're getting calcification of the elastic fibers that's just a really microscopic amounts of calcium that just kind of adheres to those uh, abnormal uh, uh, elastic fibers so just make sure you know the patterns of, of calcification but know the fact that where you can see calcification you've seen in, in a lot of different settings so that's good that's pretty straightforward uh, one there Okay, might want to give this one a go. I can go, I can do this one. Um, so this is, looks neoplastic. We don't have a lot of the epidermis here. Um, looks like it's a pretty deep punch. Um, you you see, think it's a punch? Like maybe an excision. Yeah, or what? what's another type of... So we have, we think of the classic shave, punch, excision, incision. What's one other technique that we use in dermatology sometimes? Um, I don't know. What, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you've taken off cysts of people's scalps, right? Right. Pilar cyst. Do you usually use an elliptical excision there and put in 20 stitches or what's your usual technique there? I mean, you just usually like take a small... I don't know what the word, I, I, I can visualize what you're talking about, but I don't know what the word is. For. Okay. Well, you <laughs> will now. You'll never forget it. It's enucleation. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yes. E enucleation. Just think of like you're, you're taking out somebody's eye. Cut his place, squeeze it out. Yeah. 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 So that, right. so that probably happened here too, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. That would make sense. They probably thought this was a cyst. Yeah. No. Yeah. Fair. And guess what? It's not. Guess what? Nope. It is made of fat cells. <laughs> um, so there is like groups of oedipocytes here. Um, you, think I don't think, you think it's benign or malignant? I think that it's benign. I mean, it looks- Yeah, yeah. And yeah. also, you know, when things nucleate out and pop out like that, that's another sign that they're almost always benign. If right. you try to pop out a metastatic melanoma, they don't pop out. Right, right. You know, even though they feel like a marble, if you cut into those things, you say, uh oh, something's wrong here. It doesn't, it doesn't pop out of the skin. You know, cysts usually do. You have to push on them pretty hard, but they often just pop right out. Well, this this lesion probably popped out and they probably thought it was a cyst. So it's most likely benign. And it's, you said it's adipocytes. Okay. So it's a neoplasm of fat. That's likely benign. It's symmetrical, well circumscribed, et cetera. Um, anything particular about these adipocytes here? Um, so I don't see a whole lot of inflammation. I do see some mucin. Good. I, um, so that blue kind of like amorphous material there. Um, the other thing that I can see are some kind of like spindly cells. Okay. What do you think those spindly cells are here? Probably Maybe. spindle cells. Yeah, there's some spindle cells. These are actually a little bit of florette cells here, interestingly. Okay. okay. So what's the diagnosis? I would say spindle cell lipoma. Do you like spindle cell lipoma more or what's in the close to that? close to a spindle cell lipoma, um, like fiber. Be careful of just looking at something and reading a book and saying that's what it is. What's the most, so we got lipoma and we got lipoma. mostly mucin. So what's the best diagnosis? Pleomorphic lipoma. Well, we would have to have a lot more of these cells. We got a couple of them in there, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, there's a, there's a component of pleomorphic lipoma, but we've got mucin plus lipoma mm -hmm. equals what is, I don't know, mucinous lipoma? Mixoid lipoma. Mixoid lipoma, okay. <laughs> mixoid lipoma. And mixoid lipomas commonly do have some, you know, uh, spindle cells in there as well. They probably, there's an overlap between spindle cell lipoma and mixoid lipoma. So there's no magic here. It's just basically naming. So when it's mostly mucin plus lipoma, it's mixoid lipoma, mostly spindle cells with some mucin and, and fat cells, then spindle cell lipoma. It's got a lot of these, pleomorphic florette cells, not just three or four, but a lot of them, 
pleomorphic lipoma. So again, if you see a lot of those and you see lipoblasts, then you think of either a lipoblastoma or you think about the possibility of liposarcoma in that situation, but those generally don't pop out. They're usually much larger. So, so this is just a mixoid lipoma. Okay. Okay. So just another variant of lipoma. There's about, you know, five or six different variants of lipoma. And uh, if they were going to show you a liposarcoma, they're not going to show you anything that looks like this. They're going to show you something that's obviously very atypical and very bizarre, and it's going to be ugly and cancer. So they're not going to show you um, something that's pretty bland in its appearance. Okay, let's do this one. This is diagnostic at this power. Um, I can go. Good. So this is a punch biopsy. It looks like I see a lot of hair follicles <coughs> and um, adipose tissue. Uh, so I'm presuming this is the scalp. Good. Um, Good. Normal and scalp? Going... Hmm? Normal or oh, abnormal? Uh, it looks non-inflammatory and non-scarring. So I think it's... Or you're saying it is an alopecia then? Uh, I, I'm assuming it's an alopecia based on the you're context of... You're going to apply, you're gonna apply criteria and say it's alopecia for certain because of... Just the context of the biopsy. But then... Uh, well, you're uh, right, it is the scalp. You're right, it is the scalp. If I biopsied your scalp, would it look like this? Um, you better say no. I hope, I hope no. <laughs> I hope you got a nice, luxurious know, head of hair. And if we biopsy it, what are we going to see normally here? Uh, I guess you would see, um, I guess... We're going to get rid of that guessing. We're... we're we're gonna, this isn't a guessing game. You're going to be able to apply criteria and tell me exactly for sure what is normal scalp if I buy it to your scalp. So I guess the hair follicles would extend further down. Yeah, they should be down here. And how many of them should we have? Um, I'm trying a to remember. Four millimeter punch, about how many should we have in a, on a vertical section like this? I'd say maybe like five i, I don't uh, a little higher about eight higher seven eight, or eight. Okay. so eight mm -hmm. how many we got here in the fat uh zero zero or, zero yeah. this guy's in trouble mm. it's probably it could be a gal but it's probably it could be a guy too whoever it is they, they got they've lost hair here this is an alopecia by definition no guessing definitive foo for sure it's like a small sword in the gut we know it's an alopecia Okay, and then once we get alopecia, then we have some criteria that we use, right? Uh, yes, but then um, what's now, now? Here's this is more important in this biopsy here that we're looking at than whether there's inflammatory or not. Okay, we're gonna that's that is one criteria: is inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and you know there's there's probably some inflammation here. Um, it's largely kind of gone away because you know, there's still a few lymphocytes in here, but mainly because this thing is kind of, it's synchronized and everything is kind of, it's in a, it's, it's getting ready to shed every, they probably shed all the hair and it may be getting ready to kind of start reforming a new crop of hair follicles if it can do that. But mm -hmm. notice all these look like they're in the same stage of involution. They all look the same, don't they? They're like little identical twins. There's only one disease in dermatology that will do that. Uno. Telogen effluvium? You're close, but no cigar. Because mm -hmm. telogen effluvium doesn't get all of the follicles in the same stage. It gets some and leaves some alone. That's why it's not, you, you, when telogen effluvium, it doesn't look like a billiard ball. You don't get that nice, you know, shiny alopecia like you see with this disease. So total synchronization, foo, everything at the same time can give you overnight whiteness, overnight grayness. World War II, you know, they, in the, when they're bombing, a lot of people lost all their hair and then sitting in the tube in, in London because they were so scared of everything. They, they documented overnight graying of the hair because they would shed all their dark hair because the gray hair is, is more resistant to the inflammatory response of this disease. 
and it gets rid of the dark hair, synchronizes, kills all the dark pigmented hairs, but leaves the white ones intact. So what's the diagnosis? I can't, yeah, I'm not sure. Having a chat sharing it, somebody's got to say it. AA, uh -oh, yes. Okay. Nothing other than AA does this, period, the end. I don't need to see the, the swarm of bees. Now, there's a little bit of a few bees left here. Most of them are back in the hive, but there's a couple left. But when they all, all the follicles get synchronized like this, they go from antigen to catagen at once, boom, and then they all go to telogen. This is alopecia areata. Nothing else does this, okay? And if you look over on this side, you know, we may even see uh, a follicle that's maybe got a couple of dyskeratotic keratinocytes in it. That's a catagen follicle. So nothing shifts all of your follicles from antigen to catagen except AA. That's it. Nothing does that. If anybody says they do, they're lying. So this is, this is the only thing that will really do this. Synchronization of the follicles. Classic. So if we were to see this maybe a day earlier or a couple of days earlier, we probably would see the little swarm of bees. Uh, we do get, this is the beginning of so-called a fibrostella, a little residual sort of star-like area. It's not, I don't think it really actually comes from star, but it's a fibrostella. That's what we refer to. We get a lot of those left. That's the last thing you see with AA. So if you biopsy somebody with AA that's, that's got alopecia universalis, you'll just see a lot of these sitting in the fat down where the follicles used to be, okay? And so when these things cycle, they'll go up here and then you'll see a new follicle start up and then it'll, you know, go through the cycle and then it gets wiped out again with lymph signal infiltrate. And then you get this, uh, these pole pinkus constrictures and then, then break off and it gives you the exclamation point hairs. So that's basically alopecia areata here. Uh, how about pattern alopecia? Never, never, never. Mm. And you could tell me why. What does pattern alopecia look like? Um, Low power, what does that look like? Low power. I mean, I just know that they both share miniaturization. They both have. They do, but the reason you get pattern alopecia is because you've got androgen excess and androgen hypersensitivity to the androgen that circulates. So the sebaceous lobules get really big. Mm -hmm. So that looks okay. like the face, but it's the scalp. You get lots of large sebaceous lobules and you don't get the little fibrostelly there and you don't get synchronization of the follicles. So there you just see a fewer number. You see like lots of follicles that look like this, but they get the large sebaceous lobules. Okay. So it, it, it looks quite a bit different than this. Okay. Everybody got that one? Or nobody got that one? <laughs> we'll have to give you the lecture on uh, alopecia. Yeah, bees are going extinct. Who ever said that? And then uh, when do you usually use like horizontal sections though? So, so we do, we do. We love horizontal section. That's what this is over here. This is a horizontal section. Uh, you see it's also synchronized over here. This one's, this one's at the level of the sebaceous lobule. So it's got a few more over here. But in this case, the better one to look at it is this one. Here, here's another. This is also horizontal section. See, this one's still got a few little bees over here in this one. But they're both like going from antigen. This is catagen here. Look at that. See this big, thick, glassy basal membrane? That's a catagen follicle here. It's been shifted rapidly from antigen to catagen. And when you do that with multiple follicles like that, AA. Okay, so think that. You'll be way, way, way ahead of most of your colleagues that are going to be taking that exam with you. You'll, you'll just beat them into the dirt when they show you a picture of this on the, on the exam. They'll probably show you more of a pedestrian form that's got the classic bees of, of a swarm of bees. And sometimes you'll get some, lymph, some eosinophils um, in uh, AA also, but this is a better diagnosis. Do you know synchronization of follicles, fibrostelly, with or without residual lymphocytes? Everything gets shifted into catages at the same time, well, then you're home free. How much more time do we have? Are you guys need to go on to clinic or everything? Or are you good to go for maybe one more? I think one more is fine. Okay, good. All right. Sometimes the best power is low power. You know, sometimes you have to go to, sometimes the diagnosis is made at high power, but sometimes it's really better at low power. 
So maybe I'm not going to let you go any higher than this. All right, I can go again. <laughs> uh, this, this is a punch biopsy. Um, looking at the high power, a lot of collagen. And this, is, this is low power. Sorry, low power. And then um, um, I was thinking, since we have limited time, I, I was thinking interstitial GA. What's uh, the shape of the biopsy? Right, you, you said GA for a reason. Uh-huh. What's the shape of the biopsy? Like a square? Yeah. Yeah. Why is it a square? We've already seen another square today too, right? When the mm -hmm. NLD kind of square? Um, I mean, I just presume just based on the thickness and the sclerosis of the specimen. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see sclerosis in GA? You can, but. No, no, I'll, no, uh, no, 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 no. No, no, okay. you know, never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, good. But it's square and it is sclerotic. You're right. You're right. It is sclerotic. You see sclerotic in NLD. Mm -hmm. right? Sclerotic collagen and degenerated collagen in NLD. But what do you, what's, what's, when you see sclerosis, what should your reflex arc be? I mean, you go through the fibrohistocytic proliferations. Well, what causes sclerotic collagen primarily? Remember, that's one of the nine inflammatory skin patterns is fibrosis and sclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, Don't overthink it. Like scleroderma? Or yeah, yes. The sclerosing disorders, scleroderma, morphia, eosinophilic fasciitis, you know, all those things that can give you sclerotic collagen. So you see a square biopsy, low magnification, your first reflex should be to think of, of one of the sclerosing disorders. You're gonna hire magnification, and then you're gonna see, well, is it really sclerotic collagen or not? And is there a decrease or an increase in the number of fibroblasts? And yeah, you start looking here and there's some zones where there are no fibroblasts, the collagen bundles are homogenized. There's a lot of inflammation here too, right? Yes. What kind of cells are these? Um, Histiocytes. Well, look carefully. Are they really histiocytes? There's an EO right there. And notice the pattern. It's mostly interstitial once again. Mm -hmm. So if you biopsy one of the sclerosing disorders at an early stage in its evolution, what does it look like? Sorry, uh, I lost connection a little bit. Could you repeat it again? If you biopsy one of the sclerosing disorders in, its, in an early stage of evolution, look at this, this beautiful sclerotic collagen here. Mm -hmm. No fibroblast, homogenization of these collagen bundles. So if you biopsy one of these disorders like morphe or scleroderma or whatever in an early stage of evolution, what's the pattern of inflammation that you see? I guess, so I guess interstitial. Yes, interstitial mostly. So um, what's the diagnosis? I guess scleroderma. Yeah, it, it's just like inflammatory. Or early morphia. scleroderma, oh, morphe. But then yeah. um, I would, you can't tell I, those I, apart. I find you can't I tell those to, apart. So I wouldn't, I, you never, you're not expected to tell those apart. But this would be like inflammatory morphia, inflammatory, you know, acrosclerosis. They could have crest. You know, we don't know what they have. They probably don't have eosinophilic fasciitis because this is going on in the dermis. But this is, is it, this is basically what inflammatory morphia looks like. And this is the interstitial mostly pattern, which we've kind of had today. We've had NLD, which gives you interstitial mostly. We've had this. Um, so again, it's a little theme that we've sort of had. And, and it actually, this is what you see when you see early involving inflammatory morphine. This is kind of when you'd like to get it. Because if you get it at this stage, you can maybe treat the inflammation and you might be able to re you know, reverse some of that thick sclerotic change. I mean, they're already got a lot of sclerosis here, but maybe you could kind of reverse some of that if you, if you uh, go ahead and hit this inflammation hard. But good, but, no, but you picked up on that square biopsy. So again, square biopsy, think sclerotic disorder. You can sclerotic edema, which uh, can give you a square biopsy, and that's really not sclerotic. It's just kind of thick collagen with mucin. Oh, we got through 12 out of 15. So we, uh, we got through quite a few today. So we'll, we'll add these last three we didn't make today. The next time we